in the classical and modern languages, literatures, and cultures department, where she received her BA, MA, and PhD from University of uh, Minnesota, where it's much colder than here. It's so very, she, yes. So she's, she's accustomed <laughs> to that. Uh, her research interests include fairy tale studies, early modern women writers, the tragic story, um, 18th century cause celebs, um, early modern literature and culture, history of the French theater and orientalism in French literature. So you see, she's She's um, uh, multifaceted. Uh, she has one published book, uh, Salinieri's uh, Furies and, and uh, Fairies, Politics of Gender and Cultural Change in Absolute France, which was published by the University of Delaware Press in 2005. And her second book project uh, is what she's going to be talking about. It's entitled uh, Enchanting Subversions, Class, Gender, Sexuality in the Fairy Tales Cinema of Jacques Dumont. Uh, she's a frequent contributor to the Greenwood Encyclopedia of Folk Tales and Fairy Tales, uh, edited by Don Hasse, who promised to be here. Oh, he couldn't make it. <laughs> the um, Oxford uh, companion, companion to Fairy Tales, edited by Jack Sipes, um, Archetypes and Motifs and Handbook. By, edited by Hassan uh, Sharm and Jane Geary. She's also written and published over 20 art journal articles and book chapters, including rape and socio-political positioning in the, his, in the history tragic, in the history of He's tragic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> in early modern, um, she published that in early modern women and into the an interdisciplinary journal that was published in 2010. And she had an interview with Jacques uh, Barcelon uh, from free French soldier to fairy tale pioneer in Marvels and, and Tales, spring 2012. However, as director of the Humanities Center, I was hoping to have more people to, to tell how I'm absolutely grateful I am to, um, to and for her involvement in the programs and administration of the Humanity Center. Um, the center's mission uh, is to center's mission is to is to support the research and art of Wayne State University faculty. But if a prom if promising scholars like Professor Duggan do not participate. It would be like building a wonderful baseball park, but having nobody come to play. <laughs> so uh, she has uh, involved herself in our work. Uh, for example, um, since, two, since 1999 to the present, she has participated in a number of our working groups. Uh, working groups in interdisciplinary approaches to fairy tale, um, interdisciplinary approaches to Arabian night, fairy tales in visual culture, the full theory and practice, modern, early modern culture, gender and sexuality. So those are some of the, the, the groups she has participated in. In 2003, uh, she, she won an Innovative Projects Award from us uh, for a project entitled Creating Storytelling and the Urban Child. That sort of melt through, though. We can skip that one. It does actually, yeah, it, it, yeah. It, it, we kind of dropped. It dropped it. Yeah. Dropped out. Okay. Well, in, in, in 1999, she, in our theme, adults and children, she um, she she won an award and, and gave a talk with the following year. Colleagues, uh, the the Marie and the production of elite subjects. In 2002-2003, in our religious and secular um, theme, she had a, 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 a successful project entitled The Bishop of Delhi's Bloody Stories, Divine Justice in the Theater of the World. In 2005-2006, in our theme, Translation and Representation, she had a successful project entitled The Tragic Story 
an exercise in translation. And in 2009-2010, in our theme, Gender and Sexuality, she had a successful proposal entitled The Queering of the French Revolution and etc. And then our fall symposium in 2009, she gave a talk on Jacques Demore with a pipe piper for this disease in, in the provincial city. So you see, um, Anne is a, a very frequent participator in our programs, and I, I want to let her know that we value this and hope she continues to be a friend of the center. So you can see it is with great, great, great pleasure I ask you to welcome to the podium uh, Professor Anne Dobber, who's going to talk today about queer enchantments, gender, sexuality, and class in the fairy tale cinema of Jacques Demont. Professor. Thank you, Walter. And I have to thank the Humanities Center because um, part of what made possible writing the book was a grant I got, a Humanities Center grant, that allowed me to go study in Paris. Mm -hmm. or I, I went to the Cinematheque, which allowed me to do some research on the book. Um, the blurb I gave on the flyer is maybe I'm going to touch on some of that. I wasn't, to be honest, sure exactly what I was going to talk about today, and I had a lot to draw from because the book is finished and it's going to be coming out in the fall. Um, and so what I decided to do today is talk about a little bit about the framework of the book um, and, and sort of some of my theoretical frameworks. And if you have questions about what's on the flyer, I'd be happy to talk about that too. And I, like I said, I'll, I'll touch on that marginally. And I just wanted to give a filmography. Um, for people who are not familiar with Jacques Demy, probably his most famous film for American audiences has been The Umbrellas of Cherbourg. Um, but he's, he's done a lot of film and uh, he he's, has a marginal place within, within the French New Wave, and what I'm going to talk about today is largely coming from my introduction, so I'd also welcome any feedback. I still have time to change. I don't have the page proofs yet, so, so here we go. Perhaps less known today than his wife, Agnès Varda, Jacques Demy has always held a tenuous place among directors of the French New Wave. To the uninitiated, his films can seem strange, even laughable, in their use of sung dialogue. His color schemes convey a sense of gaudy artificiality that bears affinities with the films of John Waters, yet his films communicate a sweetness and melancholy not quite present in the American director's films. Demi's campy fairy tale aesthetics and melodramatic plots have influenced since the late 1990s a generation of queer filmmakers in France who demonstrate a new appreciation for Demi's cinema, an appreciation that earlier critics could not quite grasp. Two essential aspects of the cinema of Jacques Demy have been understudied, overlooked, or ignored. The importance of the genre of the fairy tale on the one hand, and the queer sensibility of his films on the other. Queer enchantments foregrounds both in an attempt to ask what Demi's cinema can tell us about the fairy tale, and what the fairy tale can tell us about Demi's cinema. Such questions are intricately connected to the ways in which Demi unsettles conceptions of gender, sexuality, and class in order to open up the identity categories that often stifle his hero heroes and heroines, at the same time that he broadens the possibilities of the genre of the fairy tale through his cinematic revisions. Thus it is specifically the queerness of the enchanted worlds of Demi's films as I argue, that marks the distance between his cinematic of and the rest of the new wave. While critics have often alluded to Demi's fascination with fairy tales, from those of Charles Perrault and the Brothers Grimm to the filmic versions of Walt Disney Studios, few have actually examined the extent to which the genre has influenced the shape of so many of Demi's films. Indeed, Demi was profoundly marked by the fairy tale genre producing films in which he explicitly drew from well-known tales. Donkey Skin might not be as well-known in the American tradition, but in the French tradition, it's a very central tale. It's sort of a, 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 an incestuous Cinderella tale is maybe the quickest way to describe it. Um, and the heroine has to disguise under the, a donkey skin to escape her incestuous father. Um, so he did a version of Donkey Skin, um, The Pied Piper with the pop star Donovan, and um, 
uh, the Pied Piper and others in which Demi integrated fairy tale elements, including his Oscar nominated The Umbrellas of Cherbourg with Catherine Deneuve. This encounter between Demi's films and the genre of the fairy tale works to disarticulate the fairy tale from normative representations of gender, sexuality, and class often associated with it, resulting in the troubling of the values and identities such narratives can communicate. Demi's films furthermore bring to the fore the inherent tensions and troubles that were always already present and never quite resolved in his source tales. Demi characterized his films as being enchanté, playing on the double meaning of the French word, which can signify both enchanted as well as in song, referring to his uh, unique use of song verse in the Umbrellas of Cherbourg, and more generally to his interest in the genre of the musical. The notion that his films are somehow enchanting reverberates with Demi's critics, who title their studies with reference to dream, enchanted cinema, magical realism, and other world or demi worlds. Enchantment, of course, brings to mind images of enchanted palaces and fairy tales, as well as the idea of being under a magic spell. To enchant can mean to attract, win over, compel, or induce. And indeed, Demi hoped to draw, in, draw his spectators visually and emotionally into his films through the use of elaborate sets, music, and recourse to melodrama. As his French biographer Jean-Pierre Bertomy and Camille Taboulet have made clear, Demi had been fascinated by fairy tales since his youth. At age seven, Demi animated his own version of Snow White using a roll of toilet paper, which he illuminated with a flashlight. With the help of his father, Demi designed and built a puppet theater where he presented tales by Perrault, such as Cinderella and Donkey Skin. And so Donkey Skin is a tale he'd been fascinated with ever since he was a child. Demi dressed his marionette princesses in fabrics found in the drawers of his grandmother as seamstress in Nantes. In the early 1950s, just before apprenticing with the French animator Paul Grimaud, Demi had written a version of The Sleeping Beauty the story of a princess bewitched by an evil genie, whom a young amorous poet dreams of saving. Demi, in fact, produced an excerpt of the projected film as a demo for producers and advertisers when he first started working in the industry. As a filmmaker, Demi furnishes us with a particularly interesting example of an auteur who was ex extensively inspired by the genre of the fairy tale, which I use here in its broadest connotation, to include folk tales or mersin, as well as marvelous tales. In, such, in films such as Donkey Skin, The Pied Piper, and Lady Oscar, Demi rewrites marvelous tales, legends, and folk tales. Although not immediately evident, closer examination reveals that Lola, The Umbrellas of Cherbourg, Les Demoiselles de Rochefort, and A Slightly Pregnant Man are either structured around or make reference to folk and fairy tale motifs. Given Demi's youthful interest in and experimentation with fairy tales, it should come as no surprise that the genre made such an impact on his overall cinematic oeuvre. The 1950s Hollywood musicals of Gene Kelly also left their mark on Demi's films. And like the fairy tale, the musical's fanciful aesthetic demands the suspension of disbelief as the spectator enters into the world of the marvelous. What Jessica Tiffin has said about the fairy tale in cinema is also true about the musical. Quote, cinema, like fairy tale, is a form of illusion. It's viewers willingly suspending disbelief in order to surpass reality and experience the magical. Whereas the fairy tale, like film, carries the reader or spectator out of the world of the everyday into an other space, the musical transforms the everyday into a space of the marvelous through dance and song. In all cases, the world, the world of the everyday is transcended, which opens up new possibilities of movement, sound, and sight. A film like Donkey Skin, a musical that's also a filmic rewriting of a fairy tale, truly highlights the affinities between these genres. The fact that Demi himself played on the double meaning of enchanté suggests that he saw such connections between the tradition of the musical and the enchanted fairy tale. However, Demi takes a very complicated view of the fairy tale genre and the musical tradition, part and parcel of, Hollywood, Hollywood, of the Hollywood Dream Factory. In his films, Demi constantly moves between different positions, one moment relishing in the aesthetics of the marvelous, another moment reflecting on the often tragic consequences of conventional fairy tale plots, 
the next teasing out what might already be subversive in these stories and overall opening up the possibilities of the genre. Such tensions have always underscored folk and fairy tales as well as Hollywood film. As Jack Sipes has noted, quote, from the very beginning, folk tales tended to be contradictory, containing utopian and conservative elements. And regarding the motion picture industry, Jane Gaines similarly remarks that the dream factory produces bourgeois hegemonic fantasies as well as utopic hope landscapes. In his fairy tale films, Demi takes what initially may appear to be utopic heterosexual fantasies and brings out their internal tensions, at times turning them into dystopic tales. As a queer director with working class roots, Demi paints such fantasies with ironic distance and reveals the gut-wrenching disappointment that occurs upon fulfillment of these prefabricated dreams. The specific context of Demi's world, 1950s and 1960s France, was characterized by a renewed sense of material comfort and national identity after the humiliations of World War II, along with, according to Kristen Ross, a new ideology of love and conjugality, which coincided with state natalist policy. Life was reordered around the consuming urban heterosexual couple and car ownership, with local economic practices and structures giving way to the adoption of American business practices. Demi's films question the post-war economic and social order in France and the supposed fairy tale ending this order was to bring. Demi often blend, blends non-heteronormative and working class concerns into his films, which often results in the undermining of the traditional happy ending. In the umbrella, Cinderella may have married her wealthy bourgeois prince, but perhaps she would have been happier with her working class lover. Donkey Skin may have invaded the advances of her incestuous fa father, but will she truly live happily ever after with her prince? And there's actually in the film, it's suggested that um, she sort of does want to marry her father, but knows that she shouldn't. Um, <laughs> at times, Demi seems quite aware that what appear to be innocent tales for children are in fact mature stories that, that allow and even encourage the exploration of questions pertaining to gender, sexuality, and class. In so many respects, Demi's queer enchantment set him apart from his new wave contemporaries. As Richard Newport affirms, Demi shared, quote, in the stylistic and technical revival of the new wave, yet he has never fit completely comfortably in everyone's definition of the new wave. It was the help of Godard that Demi got short George Beauregard to finance his first feature-length film, Lola, in which Demi references Godard's Breathless, and Demi worked with Godard collaborator Raoul Goutard on the shooting of Lola. Both directors were in interested in the genre of the musical, but to different aesthetic ends. Regarding A Woman is a Woman, Godard insists that, quote, the film is not a musical, it's the idea of a musical. In his films, however, Demi produces musicals that challenge generic boundaries, often blending aspects of opera and operetta, with the result of creating an experimental hybrid form of the musical. One could argue that Godard's relation to the genre of the musical is based on abstraction, a quality Genevieve Serrier has identified as a unifying concept among new wave directors. Demi, however, gives very concrete and material form uh, to a singular conception of what a musical can do with this focus on costume, music, music, and color, simultaneously celebrating and destabilizing the genre, and, as in the case of the fairy tale, hinting at the gender and sexual trouble that has always been part of its history. Despite the fact that Godard ex expressed interest in the genre of the musical, new wave directors predominantly drew from American film noir and the western, with some directors venturing into the domain of science fiction, such as Godard in Alphaville and François Truffaut in Fahrenheit 451. Sellier importantly emphasizes the gendered nature of the genres that most interested new wave directors. American genres such as the thriller and the western, and one might add science fiction, are actually addressed to a masculine public or constructed for a masculine gaze. New Wave critics and directors celebrated these masculine gendered genres and removed them from their socio-historical context, thus avoiding, according to Sedier, 
the political and ideal ideological questions many of these films might have elicited. Regarding the group of critic directors who were associated with the Cahiers du Cinéma and Positif, Stelier remarks, quote, the articles, all written by men, pass it as an unquestion a priori that the cinephilic gaze is necessarily male, heterosexual, and directed towards icons, fetishes, and female sexual objects. Despite the fact that Celia ne neglects to take into account the importance of irony in the representation of gender and sexuality in new wave films, which might complicate her arguments, she nevertheless rightly insists upon the masculinist and heterosexist tendencies underpinning the types of films upon which new wave directors drew. Although Demi also included references to more male-oriented ori genres in his films, Michelle and Lola incarnates an idealized American cowboy type, his most significant influences were the fairy tale and the Hollywood musical, which typically have been gendered as feminine and especially in the case of the musical, considered camp art forms. The use of color is an important aspect of both. Technicolor has been the process of choice for musicals since at least 1929, and after the production of The Wizard of Oz in 1939, the saturated hues of Technicolor came to be associated specifically with fantasy, while black and white was used for more realistic genres such as war and crime films. In Chromophobia, David Batchelor discusses the devaluation of color, and if you've ever seen Demi's films, color is absolutely essential. I mean, he plays so much on color. So, uh, David Batchelor discusses the devaluation of color in Western culture, arguing that, quote, color is made out to be a property of some foreign body, usually the feminine, the oriental, the primitive, the infantile, the vulgar, the queer, or the pathological. Moreover, it is, quote, relegated to the realm of the superficial, the supplementary, the inessential, or the cosmetic. Demi very consciously draws on color to emphasize the fantasy and artificial universes in which his characters materialize, and to cite and pay homage to Disney fairy tale films, as well as the Gene Kelly musical. It is perhaps the devaluation of color, of feminine genres, of the cosmetic, that explains in part the lack of critical attention to Demi's cin cinematic oeuvre in relation to other new wave directors, despite the very self-conscious uses Demi makes of many aspects of his films. So what does this suggest about Demi's place within the new wave? Numerous critics have pointed out Demi's difference from other new wave directors, but often fall short of words to describe it. For instance, Robin Stilwell remarks, he was of the Nouvelle Vague generation, never, yet never quite one of them. For her part, Jeanette Villard insists, the thing that strikes one most in Demi's films is that they are fantasies, the fantasies of someone who does not belong to this world. What I would like to suggest is that what makes Demi's unclassifiable otherworldly films distinct from his new wave contemporaries is precisely their queerness. Like the passing references to the fairy tale, study of, studies of Demi's works make at best passing references to the ways in which his films communicate a queer sensibility, sensitivity and aesthetic with very few exceptions. There's one great study by Philippe Colomb. Moreover, the implicit ways his own queer sexuality inflects his film, in part through autobiographical inscriptions, goes almost completely unrecognized. However, his films have had wide appeal with gay audiences, and French queer directors such as François Ozon, Christophe Honoré, Olivier Duchâtel, and Jacques Martineau have all acknowledged their debt to Demi. And for instance, Ozon's um, Eight Women very consciously draws on Demi's color scheme and cast uh, Catherine Deneuve, who's really an essential actress in so many of Demi's films as a celebrity intertext in his film of 2002. As Nick Rees Roberts has noted, for instance, the demoiselle of Les Demoiselles de Rochefort, played by Catherine Deneuve and her sister Françoise Dorliac, quote, became something of camp icons in French gay popular culture. Within French academic and intellectual circles, invoking the sexual orientation of a director even when the director's sexuality influences the shape of his or her, the, his or her films take, has been a taboo subject. Alain Brassard 
expresses his frustrations with this situation in speaking about Agnès Varda's biographical film about Demi, Jaco de Nantes, in which, quote, not a word is breathed about a homosexuality that was nevertheless known and that decisively informs all of his works, enriching it against a resolutely normal new wave. Throughout queer enchantments, I argue that Demi's films indeed are inflected by queer sensitivity. Although Demi's working class background and its influence on his films are touched upon in the important biographies of Bertome and Taboulet, neither make mention of Demi's sexuality, its importance to its, his work, or even his AIDS-related death in 1990, which Varda publicly acknowledged only very recently in the beaches of Agnes. Such is issues, however, are central to queer enchantments. I foreground the ways in which Demi's fairy tale films prove to be so many reimaginings of gender, sexuality, and class, reimaginings that are part and parcel of a queer sensitivity. These queer enchantments destabilize binary oppositions such as feminine, masculine, queer, straight, lower class, upper class, nature, culture, which uphold a heterosexist bourgeois order in which capitalist men and heterosexuals are privileged over the working class women and queers. Throughout this study, I use the term queer in its expansive meaning as critics such as Alexander Doty, Chris Strayer, and Stephen Angelettis have employed it. For Doty, queerness, quote, is a quality related to any expression that can be marked as contra, non, or anti-straight. He opens up the notion of queerness to go beyond characterizing gay and lesbian practices in order to, quote, challenge and confuse our understanding and uses of sexual and gender categories. As such, Doty seeks to point out, quote, the queerness of and in straights and straight cultures and to carve out a space for individuals and groups who have been told they inhabit the boundaries between the binaries of gender and sexuality, transsexuals, bisexuals, transvestites, and other binary outlaws. In her notion of queer, Strayer similarly includes non-normative heterosexual practices, such as heterosexual sodomy and female ejaculation, that challenge the notion of a pure heterosexual based on clearly demarcated and conventionally defined masculine and feminine roles. Such redefinitions of queer work in part to deconstruct the dichotomy between gay and straight to include, in Angeletti's <coughs> words, an umbrella category for the, sexual, for the sexually marginalized. For Angeletti's, quote, instead of reifying sexual, identities, sexual identity categories, queer theory takes as its project the task of exposing the operations of heteronormativity in order to work the hetero-homosexual opposition to the point of critical collapse. Queer then refers to that no man's land between the heterosexual norm, that categorical domain virtually synonymous with homosexuality, and yet wonderfully subjects, suggestive of a whole range of sexual possibilities that challenge the familiar distinctions between normal and pathological, straight, gay, masculine men, and feminine women. These conceptions of queer are particularly useful in approaching to these films, which are often suggestive of homosexuality, at the same time that they trouble heterosexuality with the pairing of, for instance, a king and his daughter, a pregnant man with a woman, and a swashbuckling female cross-dresser with a stable boy. Demi's films carry out the queer work of challenging gender and sexual categories as well as that of social class. Although the genre of the fairy tale has often been accused of inculcating gender, sexual, and social norms, an overgeneralizing and reductive view of fairy tale history, Demi uses this fantastic genre to his advantage in his queer reimaginings of gender, sexuality, and class. Such reconceptualizations cannot be separated from Demi's own construction of self through the references to his own life in his films. The ways in which Demi weaves these autobiographical references into his various films point to a thematic uni unity that goes very much against Varda's representation of a chaste and straight Jacques. The unplanned son of a garage owner and a hairdresser, Demi is quoted as saying, I was not a desired child. Interestingly, the rather melancholic Roland of Lola declares, only a child that's wanted is truly happy. 
It is perhaps due to this ambivalence regarding his own origins that Demi returns again and again in his films to marvelous beginnings. Historically, the fairy tale has often dealt with questions pertaining to conception and birth, including couples who cannot get pregnant, immaculate conceptions, the birth of princes and princesses, and monstrous births. Studies from Otto Rank's The Myth of the Birth of the Hero to Holly Tucker's Pregnant Fictions, Childbirth, and the Fairy Tale in Early Modern France have documented the rich history of conception and birth in the genre. In several of his films, Demi invests, invents almost mythic beginnings for his characters, many of whom bear traces of Demi's own past, although his concerns go beyond autobiography and his general preoccupation with legitimating marginal figures like the artist and the cross-dresser. In Lola, the title character played by Anu Geme is a cabaret dancer and single mother whose son Yvon never knew his father Michel. The film ends dramatically with an otherworldly Michel entering the cabaret the El Dorado to reclaim Lola and his son, transforming the fatherless boy into the son of a modern prince. Not realizing that the unmarried Genevieve is pregnant with a, with a Guise child, Roland remarks in the Umbrellas of Cherbourg that Genevieve re resembles the virgin with child he had seen in Antwerp. Such a remark pokes fun at notions of immaculate conceptions, at the same time that it nevertheless suggests some kind of marvelous origin. Like the Queen of Snow White, who wishes for a child with lips as red as blood and skin as white as snow, Genevieve dreams about having a daughter named Françoise, just as Guy wishes for a son named François, and their desires eventually materialize, albeit not as the couple they had once imagined they would be. In the case of the tale in the film, the imagined portrait, gender, and name of the child, of the anticipated child, precede and influence conception and birth in ways that recall the impact of the, imag the imagination was believed to have had on the fetus in early modern folklore and medicine. That's uh, Mastroianni and Catherine Deneuve. Um, I love the title in French because um, it's the most important event ever ever since man had walked upon the moon. So um, a slightly pregnant man doesn't convey the irony of the title. Um, in a slightly, a slightly pregnant man offers another kind of miraculous birth. Marco Maz Mazzetti, a driving school teacher, again, kind of associated with, implicitly with Demi's father, who's a mechanic, mechanic, informs his hairdresser wife, and again, Demi's mother was a hairdresser, uh, informs his wife, Irene, that he's pregnant. And it's really funny because she's like, who did you get pregnant by? And he's like, not you. <laughs> she didn't get it. Um, such a story provides a modern example of a tale type whose history Ro Ro Roberto Zapperi traced from religious ha hagiography and Italian folklore to the Arabian Nights in his book, The Pregnant Man. In both the Umbrellas of Schoberg and A Slightly Pregnant Man, Miraculous births are clearly associated with Demi's own biography through characters who are auto mechanics and hairdressers. In all cases, different forms of unwanted or irregular pregnancies are transformed into something truly marvelous. One area, among others, where Demi's queerness is foregrounded is precisely in these miraculous births. In the Umbrellas of Cherbourg, the fact that Guy and Genevieve respectfully name their children François and Françoise suggests a certain gender ambiguity, feminine and masculine declinations of their child that plays out fully in Lady Oscar. In this film, parental wish fulfillment with respect to a future child takes a twist. After fathering several daughters, the General de Jarget expects his wife's last child to be a boy. When the nurse announces that the child is in fact a girl, the general ignores her, declaring that his son will be called Oscar Francois de Jarget. Although people at court are aware of her true sex, uh, Oscar nevertheless lives her life as a man, dressing in soldier's garb and serving as the personal guard of Marie Antoinette. Such films, including A Slightly Pregnant Man, suggest some kind of gender ambiguity at birth and could therefore be read as so many ways of imagining the marvelous origins of a queer identity. Drawing from the genre of the fairy tale to tell the story of queer origins, Demi thus invests marginalized forms of gender and sexual identity with extraordinary value. Taken together, 
Demi's films reiterate in different ways the story of the unwanted child with an ambiguous gender identity who proves to be a fairy prince or princess. Such a cursory overview of the ways in which the genre of the fairy tale inflects and provides a sort of unity to Demi's films only begins to hint at the importance of the genre within his cin cinematic oeuvre. Throughout the book, I concentrate on how Demi draws from the fairy tale genre to explore issues pertaining to gender, sexuality, and class in order to challenge gender, sexual, and social norms. What makes such a study particularly compelling are the ways in which it highlights Demi's creative uses of fairy tale motifs to put forth liberating models of socio-sexual relations through an aesthetic that moves between visual and emotional pleasure visual and emotional pleasures of all things fairy on the one hand, and the often tragic underscenes that hold together conventional fairy tale plots on the other. Through his films, Demi points to both the constraints and the utopic possibilities of the fairy tale. Thank you. Lots of time for comments and questions. Would you quickly outline the rest of the chapters? Um, well, and actually, yeah, um, and the chapters, basically the first chapter is looking at Umbrellas of Cherbourg and Lola that provide sort of different fairy tale narratives. Um, I guess I'm looking at chapter one, uh, Lola and Umbrellas of Cherbourg as different ways of imagining sort of a Sleeping Beauty or Cinderella story. And, um, and chapter two is looking at donkey skin, and I'm really looking at the camping of a traditional tale. And because Demi was very influenced by the cinema of Jean, uh, Jean Cocteau. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm making a lot of connections there. Chapter three is um, about the Pied Piper, and it's dealing more with social class. And then chapter four is Lady Oscar. And there is sort of a progression that happens in the book that was one of the possible things I was going to talk about. But um, it's interesting because in his earlier films, um, Lola is a more ideal film. Lola is like a single mother who's not worried about social convention and has her child on her own and, um, and is sort of rewarded at the end with her American Prince Charming. Um, and that contrasts with the Umbrellas of Cherbourg, where Genevieve caves into social pressure. And instead of waiting, being a single mother and waiting for her lover to come back from Algeria, she marries the wealthy Roland, who's also compared to a character from the Arabian Nights. Um, and, and there's this sense of, um, especially in, low, in, in Umbrellas of Cherbourg, I think that we can also read these ways of, like, let's say, cross-class relations can also be read in terms of queer sexuality. Of, I think for Demi, a lot of these become a lot of these types of relationships become figures for taboo forms of sexuality. And so, in *The Umbrellas of Sherbert, she renounces her queer desire. You could say, um, in *Donkey Skin*, it's an interesting ha thing happens where kind of the convention against incest, it's not, it's denaturalized. So a lot of kind of norms that govern um, sexuality and gender are problematized. And um, donkey skin, for instance, she's like, why can't I wear, I don't understand why I can't marry my father. And the fairy says it's against legislation. And, 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 and it's not presented as something problematic. It's just against the law. It's not some kind of interiorized, you know, thing that we should be ashamed of. Um, and, and what I think is interesting is when he gets to Lady Oscar, he has, he finally has a character, there's sort of, we could read Umbrellas of Cherbourg as sort of, um, Genevieve cannot come out. Um, and she renounces, you know, she adheres to convention, um, which is also castrating in its own way. And, uh, and Lady Oscar, uh, there's there's these two moments. There's one. There's two balls in the film, and she's always dressed as a man. Uh, and when she f kind of has, she's attracted to this other male character, and he doesn't get, he 
he doesn't really like her cross dressing, I guess, or he's not into it. Uh, so she dresses as a woman to go to the ball, but she looks like she's in drag. I mean, she just, it doesn't look right. And it fails, and, um, and she kind of tried to adhere to norms of, of, of femininity, and it just, it doesn't work. But then, what I think is really important about Lady Oscar is later on in the film, in this scene, she kind of comes out, she's supposed to be dressed as a woman, um, her father has arranged a marriage to, to this scumbag, and and they're waiting for her to come dressed as a woman, and she comes affirming her masculinity, and then dances with a woman, and then bends her over and, and kisses the woman that she's dancing with. And it's a moment where she's embracing who she is, and she's not going to try to do anything else. She's not going to try to conform. This is who I am. So I think in over the course of all of his films, and I think that's one of the paths the book takes, is looking at how, you know, Demi's working through this and then breaks out. I think he also feels that there, and I don't know what he would have done if he were making films in America, because at one point he talks about Paul Morrissey, who um, was a Warhol, uh, in the Warhol group, and Paul Morrissey did this very sexually challenging challenging from the perspective of gender and sexuality. Um, and, and to me it's like, we can't do films like that in France. So I think for him to have a, a same-sex kiss in the Oscar was, this is actually, the film was done in, in English, but I think that was something challenging for a French director to do. And then that's going to come in a later film where he has um, a same-sex kiss in I think parking, which is his version of Orpheus. Uh, so, so there's there's that progression too um, that I think happens in the book. So you, you mentioned uh, being influenced by Cocteau. How influential were was the drug scene and uh, upon like um, Debbie or the people that collaborated with him? His films. Do you get that feeling that any of these films were put together by people who were, you know, experimenting with you know hallucinatory drugs? If it is, um, you know, it's hard to say. You know, uh, I mean, there's definitely sort of a, a drug scene in Donkey Skin, like a, a hallucinogenic. No one's really talked much about that, but it is kind of interesting because he, he was um, when he was filming Donkey Skin, um, Jim Morrison was hanging out and there's pictures of Jim Morrison on the set. So, I mean, to me it certainly wasn't a stranger to those, to drug culture or anything. I know, I, I just in what I've read and in interviews that I've, I've watched of him, um, I think, I don't know how much that was influential, but like the films of Paul Morrissey definitely were. What was that? You can, <clears throat> uh, to me, maybe I was absent. Distracted. So you have make allusion to uh, the breaking of a dichotomy. Yes. Can you elaborate on that for me? I am very interested. I think, um, well, like, I, if I go back to the first image I had, um, it, it, even if we look at this, I think um, there's a lot of breaking down boundaries between. That happens a lot in Donkey Skin between nature and culture. Yes, yes, indeed. And and I think uh, so. We have the princess who's dressed in a donkey skin, um, and uh, in some ways, like she also takes a masculine role. There's other ways she she could be gendered as ma more masculine than feminine. Um, she's more animal than human at different parts of the film. Um, I think at the beginning of the film, and this is something he seems to be borrowing from Cocteau in Cocteau's Beauty and the Beast, um, there's not a clear delineation between a space of nature and a space of culture, which I think in a way, um, in, in that space of the first castle in Donkey Skin, where her father has his incestuous desires for her and she has incestuous desires for him, there's a sense that well, it's a pre-cultural space, so that isn't a pro. You know, it's not a clear prohibition within that that space where we don't have things sorted out in terms of nature and culture. Um, I think just 
from the throughout in many of his films, like in uh, he has characters that are gendered masculine and feminine. So in Les Demoiselles de Rochefort, um, one of the older women in the film didn't want to marry this man because his name was Monsieur Dame, Mr. Lady, mm -hmm. you know. And, and then she comes to terms with her, by the end of the film, then she can marry him. So it's like she, so we have a lot of characters who are sort of working through their desire for uh, another character who might have this a hybrid gender identity. Um, and they, they suppress that desire, but the only way they're gonna be happy is by overcoming that. Mm -hmm. Although, another thing to me, undoes over the course of all of, his, all of his films is that like Lola ends happy. Lola always embraces her unconventional desires and, and, and has, but then he does, Demi did a second film um, called Model Shop. And the character Lola goes to LA and her Prince Charming ditched her. Mm -hmm. So there's always this you know, there's almost this idea that the fairy tale ending can only, even if it happens, I mean, first of all, the fairy tale ending can be bad if you suppress your uh, queer, your unconventional desires to conform to social norms. Um, that's one way that happy ending doesn't work. It's technically happy, but the character's not. But then you also have, even when a character's desires are fulfilled, you don't know how long that's going to last. And Lady Oscar, who um, her, she's in love with a stable boy, so there's a class issue. The stable, the guy who's working in the stables completely accepts her, her ambiguous gender identity. He totally embraces it. Um, but she has a hard time giving up her class prejudices to be with him. She does, they go march in front of the revolution, they're marching in front of the Bastille during the period of the revolution, and he gets killed. So there's the happy ending that is undone. Um, he even does that in his first film in Lola. Um, one of the characters is from um, Brossens' Les Dames du Bois de Boulogne, um, the ladies of the Bois de Boulogne, which is actually also kind of a sleeping beauty tale. And that has the happy ending where the, the heroine who's a lower class woman who ends up with her prince. He kisses, like she's about to die and she's laying in bed at the end of the film. He kisses her and she wakes up. Um, and there's this happy ending. But Demi takes that character from Bresson's film, inserts her in Lola, and we discover that her husband abandoned her and, uh, and she cheated on him and her daughter's not his daughter. So, and, and that, and Brossens' film is actually referred to in, in Lola because um, there's a picture of uh, the, the actress from, it's a, it's a still from Les Dames du Bois de Boulogne. So he inscribes her past through Brossens' film and undoes that happy ending. So, so he's constantly undoing these happy endings, yet there, there's this kind of utopic impulse there's this, you know, there's hope. We're going to move forward. We're going to try to embrace, you know, our identity and who we are. But that might not bring happiness. So it's, it's kind of an interesting dynamic that happens in those films. Thank you very much. You know, I, I also appreciated your, your comment on the umbrella of Sherbourg, the parapluie de Sherbourg. I happen to have seen this film. Yeah. In the, when I was a student in, in France. Uh, it seems to me uh, your comment, can you summarize that again? So, like, the Umbrellas of Cherbourg. Les Parapluies de Cherbourg. Les Parapluies, yeah. yeah. Um, Catherine Deneuve, uh, Genevieve, is um, in love with Guy, and her mom is from the Petit Bourgeoisie. Uh, she owns an umbrella shop, and Genevieve is in love with Guy, who is a mechanic. Again, sort of referencing Demi's past a little bit there. And Guy, they love each other, but the mother disapproves of this class, cross-class relationship. Guy has to go to Algeria, but before he leaves, 
they have sex, Genevieve gets pregnant, he leaves for Algeria, and she can't wait, because there's a whole, I mean, I argue in the chapter that there's a bit of a playing on Sleeping Beauty, because part of the Sleeping Beauty story is about waiting. And um, Lola, for instance, waits seven years for Michelle to come back, and she doesn't know where it is. Genevieve can't wait, and uh, she gets pregnant, can't deal with that, and marries Roland, who is actually a character from Lola. Um, Demi wanted to make all of his films connected, like Balzac's Comédie Humaine. Yes. So, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, Demi's uh, sexuality. You mentioned the fact that it's sort of obscured in both biographies, and it was striking to me watching Les Plages uh, then yes, yeah. then yes, to sort of see that there was no mention, even oblique or indirect in any way. Yeah. And I was just interesting if, in the way the biographies uh, treat this aspect, I had just read a biography of Simon, that's the first biography that came out for him, and it's very much a biography um, that reflects the, the, the style of the person who wrote it, and right. it's very much geared towards the aesthetic of the writer. And I was just wondering if that's just something they do, and they, they, they focus so much, they hear everything right. towards an aesthetic, uh, or is he, you know, the, more the professional and... Well, I think it's interesting that they all feel like they can bring up class, but they don't bring up sexuality. And uh, the two biographies were done in close collaboration with Agnès Varda, who has all the documentation. I mean, I actually could have gone to Sine Tamaris, but I didn't... I, you know, we don't know, I think a lot of critics are concerned, of, you know, about this sort of taboo, which I think is a bigger taboo, and, you know, it's still hard sometimes for me to go to France and talk about gender, you know. So I, I think that there is kind of an issue with the tradition of French scholarship, you know, and how you deal with questions like gender and sexuality. Um, I think there's this question, is Agnès Varda was married to Demi. She was with him when he died of AIDS. But we also, we know that he had relationships with men. Um, and there isn't much, I, I had a really hard time finding anything specific on that. But I think, you know, he has this constant interest in his films. And there is this idea of grappling with a sexual identity that is complex and, and that he can't fully, or characters can't fully express in his films. Um, so I, I do think, because that there's some French critics who, they're frustrated with the inability or the sort of this taboo nature of, of talking about those subjects. I mean, I think, I think, you know, you could say that, you know, Demet's sexuality, maybe it wouldn't be important, but given the nature of his films, it's there. It's just there and, and everyone knows it's there, but there's this idea that we can't talk about it. Um, and I think, yet, you know, I think, and I don't know exactly what's going on. Like one of the, um, I forget who's, one of the, kind of, there's this whole new group of, of queer directors in France, and I forgot which, which film it was. They cast Mathieu Demi, Demi's son, as a straight guy with AIDS in the film. So it, I don't know, there's just, I'm not sure what's going on, but it was funny, I was at the Cinematheque, and um, I, was, uh, I was just talking with one of the librarians there, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm writing a book on Jacques Demy and on the cinema, and he said, you should go to Ciné Tamaris, which is Agnès Varda's studio where she has all this documentation. And I told him, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm working on, you know, Demy's sexuality and sort of this, queer sensibility in his films, and he said, well, just don't tell her. So there's this idea that we, we don't want to hear it, and I'll be really interested to see what happens after Agnes dies. Is that going to change? Um, I mean, some people have also said Demi didn't want to talk about it. So, you know, some critics have said, is it Agnes Varda trying to protect her idealized relationship with, um, like one of the critics that I, I guess I, I mentioned in passing talks about how she depicts him as very chaste and straight in all of her films. I mean, she's reiterating this 
in not just one film, but in like three or four films. She's constantly coming back to her romantic, very straight relationship with Demi. Um, maybe, you know, she might have just absolutely adored him and didn't, doesn't want to acknowledge, you know, this other side to him. So I guess, you know, I'm not alone in sort of wondering what's exactly going on, but then there is this added thing that within French, among French scholars, you do not talk about, those are not necessarily legitimate areas of study. I mean, it took such a long time to get gender on the, on the, on, and I still, I was at a conference like three years ago, and what, the guy who organized the conference, his face was turning red and he was about to explode. Um, so there's, I think there's two issues, you know, um, are we, is Agnes um, respecting Demi's memory, the way he might have wanted to be remembered, or is it the way Varda wants him to be remembered? We don't know. And on the other hand, you know, this this pushing away of uh, gender and sexuality studies that is not fully embraced by the French Academy, you could say. Yeah. I was thinking um, just when I read the flyer even before coming that the kind of uh, narrative that I think with the book like being pre-Stonewall and post-Stonewall it kind of makes sense maybe that the film is like gradually I think you're right because I anymore. I actually argue in Lady Oscar that you know it's an I mean it's about the French Revolution but then is there is it also about Stonewall I is think it also seeing it temporally he right. gives himself a little bit more room to do that but I also just think I think it's a thing about the French Academy I mean right. I don't think it's I mean even in America before the 50s 60s it's, it's you know the love that they're not speak its name so even though it's not literally spoken right. obviously there's I think it's more of an attitude thing if that applies to what I do, but it's sort of, it's an attitude thing because nobody's done it, we're just gonna stay within the boundaries that have been defined. Right, um, and I think people are starting to break out. Yeah, so it sometimes it doesn't even have to do necessarily with the topic, it's just that how that topic has been um, delimited so far, and you wanna be trendy, but you don't really wanna be the first one. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and I also think there's the added thing that these biographers were working very closely with Agnes Banda. Yeah, and there is also the issue of control. The same thing with the biography I was mentioning. There is the, the widow is still alive and is right. controlling. If so it kind of limits, yeah. right. I also thought of, like, uh, I was studying, I did a paper with um, Rolf and Hitchcock, and like Hitchcock has a lot of content like this that's kind of obviously queer but like they said on the set like they would never talk about it like these guys are so obviously for like in 49 being portrayed as these two gay men that live together but no one ever said it and no one said it on the set either but everybody knew right so that's just i don't know i just thought it was right right and I had asked you before you began talking, I was just thinking about it right now, what was the relation of Demi to Deneuve, to the actors and actresses who worked with him, right. and their sort of complex sexuality. I was thinking, I hadn't realized that Mar Marcello Mastrani was in a slightly pregnant man. <laughs> I was right. thinking of a film uh, that I've only seen once, and I would love to have and someone explore it. It was a very early Marcello Mastrani called Bella Antonio, and uh -huh. I think it was the same thing. Right. That the subtext was so very clear. Uh, he could not have sex with any woman. Right. Uh, it was so clear but not stated. But I still think it's interesting how the director then would work with. Uh, I I'm just wondering how Deneuve and right. the Mastrani and others see they need. Uh, and I think, is there well, any info I, on that? I think um, one thing critics have talked about is that to me, very consciously, played on the persona of the actors he used. So like in Donkey Skin, it's ironic that um, the incestuous father is actually Jean Marais, who was Jean Cocteau's partner. And to me, knew that. He was, he, he knew Cocteau. His very first short film was based on a Cocteau play. Um, and he, so I think he has um, what 
you could call them celebrity inner texts so that I'm borrowing from, I forget which critics, that he's, so I think there's a bit of irony in, in his use of Marais as an actor, and even in Donkey Skin, like, even though he's dressed as a prince, or the, the king, um, <coughs> the costume and the way he looks, if you look, compare it with him as the beast in Beauty and the Beast, and a lot of critics have done queer readings of that film, um, it's very similar. I mean, it, the shape, his whole shape is, is, the costume is strangely similar to his costume as the beast. Um, so I think with him, there's definitely, I mean, Catherine Deneuve was, um, I think she, she does well this sort of ethereal mm -hmm. uh, presence that I think he was, he was looking for. Um, she was also a very, uh, like her and Marcel and Mastroianni never married. Mm -hmm. She was a very, so she, she was a feminist of the period, which um, she probably appreciated Demi's take on gender, problematizing, you know, um, so, but I don't, I don't really know, I mean, I tried to find all these interviews and stuff, but there's not as much there as I'd like there to be. <laughs> Thank you for coming on this cold winter day. <laughs>